Thank you, Erica. And don't tell the president I said this, but this is the coolest thing I have done since I've been at the White House. I am so excited to see you all. I was a journalism major at FAMU, so I've not been in your seat because I didn't get to come to the White House until I was mayor. Uh, but what an extraordinary opportunity that you all have here today. And because I'm old enough to probably be all of your mothers, I just want to tell you I am so proud of you and so happy for you and so excited for you. This, I know, will be something that you will remember for the rest of your lives. I remember the first time I rode past the White House. When I was a student at FAMU, I found some excuse to hop in a car that was coming to DC. And at that time, you could drive down Pennsylvania Avenue. And I rode by, and I went, that's the White House. I want to go in there. I want to be in there. Didn't know how it would ever happen, because I'd never seen anyone <laughs> like me inside of the White House. And here I stand uh, many, many years later. So uh, God always has these amazing dreams for us. And we don't always know when they will happen. But I truly believe that when it's in your heart, your time will come. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. And I think I'm supposed to answer some questions. Yes. And thank you, Erica, for making this happen and for allowing me to be a part of this today. So it's only fitting that we start with Ms. Kyla from Florida a &M. All right. Where's the Rattler? All right. Greetings, everyone. I am Kyla Hubbard, a third year graduating broadcast journalism scholar at the illustrious Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Also, like to add, I am a member of the Real Beta Alpha chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Oh, my God. So, the baddest is in the house today, y'all. Made my day, Sor. <laughs> Thank you. What's your number? I'm 28. All right, yes. I was number eight. <laughs> As we know, some legislators in Florida are targeting diversity, equity, and inclusion funding in our universities. The efforts of neighboring schools like FAMU and Florida State University are being compared when the initial funding differs drastically between the schools. Many teachers and students are concerned with what this means for cultural education and visibility within education as well. You've described your new position as being the front door of the White House. I'm coming to you on your doorstep as a fellow Rattler to ring your doorbell and ask, what does this proposed legislation mean for the future of HBCUs, and how is your administration ensuring that we will be protected? Uh, it's frightening. And in all honesty, I have been very hesitant to even speak about my experience at FAMU and Black Studies at FAMU for fear that FAMU would be targeted. Um, I debated and debated as to whether or not I should speak publicly about it because I didn't want to put a target on the back of FAMU. I was an English minor at FAMU, and I uh, um, focused primarily on African American literature. And I had a wonderful professor, Emma Dawson, who exposed me to Zora Neale Hurston, and she taught an entire seminar on Toni Morrison. And all of these things had just enriched me. Uh, and so when I see what's happening in Florida, it is, it's frightening, it's disheartening. Uh, it makes me angry. Uh, I remember the story of Professor, Professor Shearing of literally the law school being taken, stolen from FAMU. And the way FAMU found out that the law school was being moved to Florida State was one day they came to move the books out. And that was 1960s, I believe. Uh, so, to, so to have this conversation today, uh, it, it's in many ways unbelievable. Uh, President Biden, Biden and, and Vice President Harris have been very intentional in funding for HBCUs, very intentional in making sure that the voices of HBCUs are heard on this campus. I was with a group of HBCU presidents just last week on campus here. Uh, there's uh, an entire committee that focuses on HBCUs. We have someone from the administration who leads HBCU initiatives. So the, the money and the input is sought uh, from the admin. The money has been given. The input is sought from HBCUs on how we can continue to be partners. But it's also a reminder of how important 
it is quite frankly that people pay attention at the local level because these decisions are being made by the governor of Florida. And no matter how much money uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris pour into schools like FAMU and all the other HBCUs represented, uh, if there's a governor who has the ability and local leadership who have the ability to make these decisions, then we all suffer. So just a reminder of why elections matter, not just when it's time to go and vote for the president, but when it's time to vote uh, for your elected officials. So long way of saying, historical investment in HBCU, $6 billion from the administration, uh, but all the funding in the world, quite frankly, cannot stop uh, what the governor is doing and what he is doing is disgraceful. Next question from Kalia at Albany State. I believe Kalia's on the screen. Good afternoon. I am Kalia Kwawi. I am a graduating senior here at Albany State University majoring in mass communication. I am a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And my question is, how can smaller HBCUs like Albany State University remain relevant in the changing educational landscape, especially those that are state operated and funded? Well, I think all of our HBCUs are important. And when you think about Albany State, and even when you think about, say, Morehouse or Spelman or Clark Atlanta, some of the HBCUs that tend to get a lot of attention, those schools aren't big in size in comparison uh, to a Howard or Southern or, or FAMU or, or North Carolina a and so what's um, great about Albany State, so many things are great about Albany State, uh, but you do have the support of people in the state of Georgia for Albany State, and I think that's important for smaller HBCUs, especially state-funded HBCUs. And again, you lean in on your representatives to make sure that you all are getting the money and the funding that you deserve from the state. And I think uh, just finally, it's important that you own your space. Albany State's a great school. It may not be big in size, but it doesn't have to be big in size. It's a phenomenal school. And when you graduate from Albany State, you're gonna be a great ambassador. I said, what a great education you received at Albany State and also you have the benefit of the HOPE Scholarship in the state of Georgia. Uh, for those of you all who aren't familiar with that, if you are a Georgia resident and you have a certain GPA, then you can get a full ride at one of our state schools. That's a, a pretty good sale uh, to me, but I think our best ambassadors are our graduates and our students. All right, thank you. And our next question comes from Spelman College. Elizabeth. Hi. Project until project. Gets to you. So sorry. <laughs> it's hello. First, uh, Miss Lydia Sermon said to tell you hello. I, like I know your face. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, <laughs> we met last year. Okay. But okay. Anyways, it's really nice to see you again. And my question piggybacks off of some of the answers that you mentioned before about um, funding for HBCUs, and I wanted to know what plans does the federal government have or what plans do you think there should be to address the historic underfunding of HBCUs and minority serving institutions? Well, that's the reason that President Biden and Vice President Harris made sure that there was money set aside for HBCUs. I have a, uh, I'm paying tuition to a HBCU. My son has told me to stop talking about him in public, so I'm not gonna say where he is. <laughs> what his name is. Um, but I do know the, the challenges are many. And ironically, many of those challenges existed when I was at FAMU, and I'm seeing it now as a parent, whether it's trying to make sure that the, the paperwork is right or that you can get the, your classes scheduled. And let's not even get into the facilities. Uh, we know that's a challenge. Spelman's fortunate because you all have a great endowment. There's a lot of investment in Spelman, but unfortunately that's not spread across the board, even in um, the AU Center. So the $6 billion goes a very long way. 
president has talked about intentionality in certain programs at HBCUs that aren't traditionally found at HBCUs to help create a pipeline. Uh, but there's also a great opportunity for partnership, I believe, uh, with private entities as well. We've seen Home Depot and some other places, Retool Your School, Tom Jordan Foundation, a great support of scholarships at HBCU. So I think that it's important for HBCUs with the group that the president has convened, it's important that they communicate on how they are accessing dollars, how you access grant funding, how you are able to get into this pipeline of philanthropic support, et cetera. I went to school on the combination of Pell Grants, Gannett Foundation scholarships, uh, lottery money from FAMU, I, I mean, a, a combination of things. And I think in the same way students oftentimes have to cobble together finances to go to school, I think HBCUs have to be intentional in that same way. But again, the great part, uh, there's a great committee led by Tony Allen, president of Delaware State. They are communicating. They are getting exposure to where the resources are and how um, funding can be accessed. You are welcome. Our next question from Dariana McGee at Lincoln University on the screen. Hello, my name is Dariana McGee and I'm currently a graduating senior from Lincoln University of Missouri, majoring in journalism. And my question is, how can HBCU students get better access to local and regional U.S. government internships or jobs? Well, I think that you all, if you hadn't done so today, you need to sign up for our newsletter at the White House. As soon as I get the internship application, I start blasting it out because we don't know what we don't know. Oftentimes there's a pipeline because there's a network of alumni or whatever the case may be, and they're pushing it out. Uh, but you don't have a lot of family graduates around here. As far as I know, I'm the only one in the White House. <laughs> there may be another one. I just hadn't met that person. Um, so I think that you need to sign up for every single resource in terms of having information blasted out to you. Because by the time, quite often, and I'll, I'll give the White House internship applications as an example, by the time it got through the network I was sending it to, the applications had closed. So what that said to me was that, you know, these applications were probably flowing through some other pipelines even before I had an opportunity to, to push it out. So I would say also, you all need to stay connected as well. When you all learn of opportunities, make sure that you're sharing it with each other. Um, and also, I would check our Department of Education to see what's being pushed out through the Department of Education. Even with the White House internships, there are like 10 other subsets, at least, of internships that are happening through the federal government. Um, but you'll, it's going to take a step on you all's part. Go online, sign up, make sure that you're getting our weekly monthly newsletters from the White House, and then when these things come online, then you can also get that information. All about information sharing. All right. Our next question is from Alcorn University. Marius. Good evening. My name is Lamar Jones. I'm a master's professor major at Alcorn State University. And my question would be, what is being done to protect and develop the minds of young people from systematic algorithms Oh, you know, that's a huge discussion. And I know we all see it. You look at one thing on Instagram, and then suddenly your feed is just populated with that same thing on Instagram. And I was chuckling to myself the other day because I'm getting a lot of ratchet information. I'm like, well, what have I been looking at that now? <laughs> I went from Jesus to, <laughs> to all this other stuff. Um, but this is something the administration takes very seriously. We've seen these congressional hearings happen on this. And uh, we also have an appointee who leads science and technology. Uh, and it really is going to take what I would say kind of a holistic approach of government to address this because we're now, we're, I mean, we, we know this, but we're now seeing 
the influence of social media on mental health, especially young African American women. We know that suicides among young African American men is is up significantly, uh, and we're reading more and more about anxiety, depression, and the influence of social media. So I would say there are a number of things that are happening. Uh, I, I can't speak directly to how we are addressing the algorithms, but I can say that we are certainly addressing the byproduct of what's happening with that. And that in Congress, you're seeing social media companies being held accountable, um, called to accountability to address how this is happening with our young people. You're welcome. Our next Great question, school. Our next question comes from Allen University, Kiara Wellington. My name is Kiara Wellington, and I'm a graduating senior at Allen University. Congratulations. So now, where is that? In Columbia, South Carolina. OK. Yes, ma'am. So this that. actually goes into my next question, where we were talking about mental health. So what are some resources that you all are currently developing in order to provide fully funded graduate opportunities for HBCU students who are wanting to pursue their master's degree in mental health? That is a great question, and I'm gonna have to flip through my notes for that one, Allen University. Um, again, I know that we have been giving direct funding to help support various programs at HBCUs, but I'm gonna come back to you on that because Erica's gonna tell me if I have that response in my notes here. I'll come back to you on that one. I wanna make sure I give you the, the right answer on that. Absolutely, we'll circle back. Um, our next question is from Adabola um, at Stillman College on the screen. Oh, my, uh, my husband's grandfather went to Stillman. Hello, ma'am. I am Adebola Adebe, and I'm an international freshman, general major from Stillman College, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And my question is, um, what foreign policy has the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration, put in place? Or what administration are they working towards to ensure that international students are not left out of educational policy reforms in HBCUs? We will come back to that one too, the, on the international policy for HBCU students. Okay. Thank you, Erica. I knew I'd seen that in here somewhere. Right there. Thank you. Sure. All right. So I'm going to make sure, I'm just going to read my notes here because I want to make sure I'm, I'm answering this correctly. The Biden Harris administration believes that one of America's greatest strengths is our ability to attract global talent to strengthen our economy and technological competitiveness and benefit working people and communities across the country. For example, the Department of State and Homeland Security announced actions to advance predictability and clarity for pathways for international STEM scholars, students, researchers, experts to contribute to innovation and job creation efforts across America these actions will allow international STEM talent to continue to make meaningful contribution to America's scholarly research and development in innovation communities. So if I've not answered anything else right, we know I got that one right today. <laughs> okay, um, and I think we'll take one more question before we do our sit down one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and that's going to be from Taylor Moore, Bennett College. And also, um, Demarius, I just want to go back to what the question you asked, just because I see some stats here. Um, there was a report from the Surgeon General issued on youth, uh, uh, issued regarding youth mental health, and it noted that during the pandemic, teenagers spent in front of screens for activities not related to school the time more than double from 3.8 hours to 7.7 .7 hours per day. In 2020, 81% of 14 to 22 year olds said they, need, they use social media either daily or almost constantly. Also, you can go to the Health and Human Services website for more information on recommendations from the Surgeon General on that. That's right. pretty scary. Okay. 
Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, y'all. My name is Taylor Moore. I'm a graduating senior at Bennett College, the first college for all women, HBCU. Uh, so my question is, according to a poll conducted by NBC, 71% uh, of the population believes that the country is headed in the wrong direction. So what is the Biden administration doing to ensure that the citizens are being satisfied and they're not just hearing the voices of the White House, but the people? Yeah, we talk about this all of the time. And I always say my, my two data, data points are my son, whose name I can't mention, and, uh, and my mother, because they represent the spectrum of what people are really concerned about. I often say the streets don't lie. All it takes is for you to go into the barbershop or the hair salon to really hear what people care about. So what I would say is that what the Biden-Harris administration is doing is making sure that we are implementing policies that make a difference in the lives of the everyday people, whether it's student debt uh, relief, whether it's sending money through the American Rescue Plan funds to make sure that some of these community-based organizations that are impacting our communities, doing mental health work, crime uh, intervention work, whether we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that our policies are focused on people, that it means something outside of Washington, D.C., that it means something to everyday people and changing their lives. And we are going to press pause, and I'm going to ask the mayor to quickly maybe introduce our special guest before uh, you take a seat here. Well, we have a very special guest. Uh, as you all know, I know you have been waiting on this special guest. Um, our vice president, you all know so many historical firsts uh, for this extraordinary woman. She's a graduate of Howard University. Who's here from Howard? All right. Uh, she's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Okay, I see some pinkies up. Uh, she has been the attorney general. She's been the district attorney. She has been a senator, and now we are honored to have her as our vice president. So will you all please stand as she enters the room. Hello, <laughs> you can clap, it's okay. <laughs> So I am opening up for questions. That's correct, Erica. Is there someone I should call on first? You gave me that sheet. I'm sorry, Madam Vice. I'm awestruck too. I'm, okay. <laughs> so we have Xavier Turk from Wiley College in Marshall, Texas, and he is virtual. Oh, so we look up there. Hello. Am I good to speak? Yes. yes. Okay, how are you guys doing? My name is Xavion Turk. I am a graduating senior here at Wiley College, okay. majoring in mass communications, focused on journalism. Um, I think my question would be, what is something that you feel like is not portrayed in the media enough when it comes to black education or just being a student at an HBCU in today's age? What is not, to you, broadcast enough? as a politician or someone that's in politics? So that's a wonderful question. And um, I think that there, there's a short answer and a long answer. There's a whole lot that's not, I think, in the mainstream media that fully understands the depth and breadth of the American experience, everyone's American experience. Um, when I first took the stage as a nominee to be vice president and vice president. I um, took the stage and I talked about my family and how my family is such a big part of what brought me to that stage. And it, this is now a national, if not an international audience, because we're talking about, right, who's going to be the next it, it, president, vice president of the United States. And so I went on about who family, family to me is. And then uh, on the list of family to me, I said, my Divine Nine family. And 
there were people looking at each other, what's divine nine? And I thought to myself, you about to find out. (laughs) (laughs) But there you go. As a very quick, small example of my point. People who are covering who will be the next president and vice president of the United States. Unfamiliar with the divine nine. So that's a quick example of a point, which is that sadly there is still a lot that we are counting on you all as leaders and journalists to help us do to continue to educate the people of our country and our world about who we are as Americans. Because of course, the history, the presence and the contribution of, going with my example, members of the Divine Nine, of which we both are, is very much a part of the history of our country. So I say that also to say that as a proud graduate of an HBCU, and as we all have that common experience, one of the blessings that I realize now so many years later that I can tell you already have figured out while you're still there is that you have a special responsibility because you have had the good fortune and blessing of being in an academic environment that in every way from the walls that were constructed in your classrooms and why they were built, you have the unique ability to know that we are counting on you, that you represent the best of who we are, and that we are requiring you to lead. Because we have also learned in those places, if not in our own families or communities, that we stand on broad shoulders, who imagined that we all right now would be having this conversation at the White House. Somebody gave me, Mayor, somebody gave me a T-shirt, and and everyone here should be wearing it, and the T-shirt said, I am my ancestor's wildest dream. (laughs) All of you should be wearing that T-shirt too, right? But you, you um, you have the experience of also learning that you will be in an environment that will not allow you to be anything less than the best. That you will be required to take full advantage of all those who want to nurture you and educate you and lift you up. And then you go out there and you remember you are never alone. Because most of you will be in rooms, and I'll speak for, the two of us, if I may, you will find yourselves many times in a room where you are the only one like you, who looks like you, who has had your life experience. And the other thing you learn at an HBCU is to remember, no, I come from people. There are a whole lot of me out there. And so being in that environment gives you the charge to have the confidence to then be in those rooms and never feel small and never feel alone and never be convinced that you're the only one like you and therefore alone because no, you come from and have a whole bunch of folks who walk into every one of those rooms with you even if you can't see them at the moment. You must always feel and know that we're all present. Thank you. So we're going to go to someone in the room, if that's okay, Erica. Or do you want me to stay on the screen? All right. Well, I'm going to follow the script. Kayla Foster, Russ College. Hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Foster, mass communications major here at Russ College. Um, So my question actually goes kind of back to where we were earlier in discussion. Um, It's about how the Biden administration plans to ensure the continuity of our historical black colleges and universities. 
Well, by doing the work that um, we have been doing as an administration that we are particularly proud of, um, which includes ensuring that we put the financial resources into our HBCUs. So I think we may have had a discussion about the dollar amounts. Um, and it's in the billions of dollars around what we need to do to invest. Um, back when I was in the Senate, actually, we also got a bill passed that put money into HBCUs around upgrading the infrastructure, because as we all know, so many of our schools are very old and, and need upgrade to literally the classrooms, the libraries, things like that. Um, but also the work that we have been doing that has been focused on issues like student loan debt, because we know the disproportionate burden that our HBCU students carry um, on that issue. And, um, and then, you know, there is the whole thing about the ecosystem around an HBCU student that also requires su support. And so there are many of our policies that relate to, for example, something I did yesterday at Bowie State, which was to announce what we are doing as an administration to bring down the mortgage insurance premium, so for FHA loans, so for loans that low-income families can get to, bu to buy a home, and bringing down the cost of that even further. Because, of course, if we think about the next generation of HBCU students, if their parents have the ability to buy a home and build equity, that would make it just a little easier for maybe them to take a little equity out the home when their young, bright, child says, I want to go to college to help them pay for tuition. So there are things that we have done that have directly been focused on HBCUs, but things like that that are also about the ecosystem around an HBCU student. Thinking about the fact that I think it's something like over 60, maybe 70 percent of the people diagnosed with diabetes or, or of African Americans are diagnosed with diabetes. And for our seniors, bringing down the cost of insulin so it's capped at $35 a month, because otherwise so many of our seniors, I mean, raise your hand if you have somebody in your family who has diabetes. There you go. Right? And so bringing down the cost of insulin every month to cap it at $35 a month for our seniors so that they don't have to choose between paying rent or buying food and buying the medication a doctor prescribes. So there are a lot of initiatives. Um, and the point is to be able to see, and I would er encourage you as journalists to always remind all of us to see people in their full selves, to see people in all the facets and nuances in which everyone lives. None of us is one dimensional. And we should always require of our leaders in particular that they see people as, as, as whatever their profession is, as whatever their age is, as whatever their race is, as wherever they are geographically. Are they a parent? Are they a child? Are they a grandchild? Are they a foster child? Seeing people in the full relief of who they are. You know, in many, um, in many old world cultures, and in particular in many African cultures, um, when you meet someone for the first time, the greeting is not, pleased to meet you. It is, I see you. I see you. And you as journalists have an incredible gift to require us as the people who read your work, who listen to your work, to see all the dimensions of the things you cover and the people you cover. Right. Chloe Ryan Wolfock from Norfolk State University. Where are you, Chloe? She has on pink. What does that mean? <laughs> My favorite color is just pink. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful color. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> So my name is Chloe Ryan Wolfolk. I am a senior mass communications journalism major at the Norfolk State University, and I must say it's an honor to be here to representing my university. Yeah. So my question is, what is the administration doing to address racial inequalities and in the impact of climate change? That's a wonderful question, Chloe. So I've been doing a lot of work on the climate issue from years. Back when I was elected district attorney of San Francisco, I, I started one of the first environmental justice units of any 
DA's office in the country, and I'll tell you why. Because in San Francisco at the time, and I think still is the case, there's a, there's a community there called Bayview Hunters Point that has, at the time, and probably still does, an annual household income of $15,000. Predominantly black. And um, what we were seeing is that community was being treated like a dumping ground. And so we were seeing high rates of health outcomes, right, in that community. And I decided to take that on and deal with the polluters and the people who were doing this to make sure there was consequence and accountability for the harm that was being caused to that community. I'm describing what is referred to as an environmental justice issue. Because it's about equity, it's about fairness and the environment, right? And when I think about then anything that is about climate, we're talking about the environment, we're talking about extreme changes to the climate that manifest itself in a number of ways, including extreme weather events. Think from my home state of California, wildfires to hurricanes, tornadoes. Think about the climate issue in the context of what we need to do to deal with, for example, extreme heat and what that means in urban communities where there's only asphalt that just actually it exasperates the heat effect and where there are no trees and what that means in terms of the public health consequences of that. Think about it as the issue of lead pipes in places like Flint and other places around our country and the babies of that community then drinking toxic water which is having an impact on their learning ability. Think about where that, that in some of the worst air quality zones in our country are also low income and communities of color. And what that means in terms of high rates of asthma, which also means missed school to address those health concerns. Think of it then in the context of like, I like to think about a lot of things in the context of a Venn diagram, I love Venn diagrams. Always ask, is there a Venn diagram for this? I'm telling you, it, it will, it's fascinating when you do. So Venn diagram, those three circles, right? So on this, the intersection between climate, extreme climate, right, which is gonna be about, that's gonna be also an intersection with human behaviors about greenhouse gas emissions, what we need to do around carbon capture, right? Intersection between that, public health, and then how we're thinking about in terms of the intersection between that and education. And if you wanna add some more circles to the Venn diagram, the solutions also look like what we need to do to invest in a clean energy economy. And that's about a whole new economy with a whole new set of jobs that are gonna require engineers and, and it's gonna require people who are thinking about how to design in a way that accommodates climate adaptation and resilience. And therein lies some of the opportunities when we think about the solution to the problems, right? And then if you bring that all back, in a way that we look at that Venn diagram and also think about principles that are about equity. Who is suffering the most? Where then should we be putting in the resources? How should we be thinking about equity in terms of what should be equitable standards and the inequities on an issue like public health, education? Um, lead pipes, I'll give you an example of that on this point. So. Water coming out of lead pipes. The communities that have been dealing with this have been, the grandmothers and grandfathers have been telling us for years, it's having an impact on the children, on the seniors. Okay. So one of the things about lead pipes that's interesting, it was, lead was put in pipes all over the country. So it was not only in communities of color, poor communities. But here's the thing. If you have money, if you had equity in your home, you'd say there's lead in those pipes. I need to get rid of those, leads, lead, those pipes and replace them. And you would buy some new pipes. <laughs> if you don't have the money to replace the pipes, if you are a renter, what ends up happening, right? 
We think about it in terms of the health consequences to the children living in that community. And what that has meant in terms of what we have documented over generations. So all of those issues are issues that are relevant to how we should be thinking about equity, climate, climate justice, environmental justice, but also I urge you guys, as you write and think about the future and how you're gonna leapfrog into your role of leadership, really do start to take a look at what we are creating around a new economy, which is a clean energy economy. Because by the way, communications major, we're gonna need you to know how to talk about this issue. We're gonna need you to help us articulate why we need to put resources into the things that we just discussed. If you're studying HR, whole new industries are being created. We're gonna need you to work there. It's not only about engineering and science, it's gonna be about also thinking about all the construction that's gonna happen. And so who's gonna be doing that? Some of the best paid work is work that's about the building trades, where there are four-year apprenticeships for people who, whose track may not be college. But in the apprenticeship, they get paid while they're going to school to learn a skill that is a highly skilled kind of work to build all the infrastructure. And what are you doing to think about how we inform the young people of our community for whom they don't want to go to college or that may not be their track Inform them about labor unions and what labor unions do in terms of apprenticeship programs and what might be available for folks there because when you're part of a labor union, then you'll be part of a whole group that will fight for your workplace safety and your benefits and your health care and your pension, right? So I would ask you, I know we're running out of time, but I would ask you to, to on, we need you guys to lead. We need you to lead and to see what's coming and to help deconstruct it so people can see themselves in the future and help people understand how they fit into that and the opportunities that are available. And I need your help to do that. Because there are a lot of new opportunities opening up. And we want to make sure that people know that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And our last question is from Jalen Clinch from Florida Memorial University. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Jalen. Oh. Hey, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jalen Clinch. I'm from Florida Memorial University. I major in communications and public race relations. Um, first off, I just before I ask my question, answer I ask my question. I just want to say it's an honor to meet you guys. Thank you for everything that you do for our black communities. Um, my question is to you is, sorry, what is the administration doing to support small businesses and inspiring entrepreneurs like myself? That's a wonderful question. So. Access to capital. Access to capital. We do not lack for good ideas or ambition. But often, folks don't have access to capital to start a small business. I mean, you go back to like, again, let's deconstruct all the issues. Home ownership. So allowing families to be able to afford to buy a home means they can build up equity so that the, one of their children may say, I want to go to an HBCU, I need help paying for tuition. The other child might say, and I want to start a small business and I need some startup capital. See how these issues are all connected? So access to capital. And what we have been doing is, in particular, and I've been traveling around the country meeting with small businesses and talking with folks about it, increasing the money that we're putting into community banks. They're called CDFIs, and Community Development Financial Institutions. Because community banks are really well situated and, and designed to understand the needs of the community, see the talent in the community, and then invest in all of that. So as opposed to the big banks, 
right? The big banks, I've, I've met so many small business owners who have told me, I went to a big bank because I had this idea to start a restaurant, a catering business. And I heard them use a term referring to me that I had never thought of and even heard before, unbankable, right? Because the model that they were thinking about didn't necessarily suit what big banks finance. But community banks understand, oh, you want to start this kind of restaurant in that neighborhood. Oh, there, there is a desire for that. Plus, as a community bank, we are going to actually also understand that we might need to give some assistance in terms of helping folks understand how the tax structure works when you start a small business so that you pay those taxes on time. Help people know how to keep their books. Help people know how to manage their credit. Help people know how to deal with employee payroll, right? So one of the things that we have been doing as an administration in support of small businesses is that, which is putting more resources into community banks and also putting more attention into what we need to do around financial literacy. That's another thing I'd ask you journalists, to really spend as much time as you can on which is helping people to know the assets, that the, 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 the resources that are available to them, to learn the skills that aren't natural if you've not been taught them before, which is how to manage your credit, how to maintain a good credit score, because if you have a bad credit score, that's going to mess up almost every other opportunity you want to have. Including that credit card that they can get in college. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Like, Watch out for that. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. That is something that is, it, it's such, it's seemingly small thing like teaching people financial literacy that can either set them up for, for, for success or just keep them down. Because once you get a bad credit score, it is so difficult to rehabilitate. But all of that is connected to small businesses, right? Which is, we have so many good ideas and we want to encourage them, but we want to get people to know what they've got to do in other areas of their life to actually be able to then pursue their ambition around an idea and create a small business. Let's give our vice president a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. We are going to take a picture that I'm sure will be the Christmas card for a lot of families in this room. Um, but so let me just, I'm gonna close by saying this. Um, your voices are so important. You as journalists have such a unique skill, gift, and ability to really be a voice of, a voice for, so much that is important in our country. And so use your voices. Continue to use your voices, because we need you. And we need you to also, for your generation of leaders, talk about things like climate, right? Starting a small business. And know that your experience at this moment in time, you all just went through a pandemic and what that meant in terms of your experience with your educational process. We have so many young people, people of every generation in our country right now that are really battling with mental health and need to know they're not alone and know where to go for resources. Not to mention all that we already have talked about in terms of economic opportunities. But we need your help. Because as a presidential administration, we are going to only be able to be as effective as our ability to reach all the people who deserve to be seen and heard. And in that way, you all and what you do is so important to remind people that they are not alone and that there are resources available to help them. So with that, thank you. <laughs>